Let us begin with uh, Judge uh, Aiken, Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court of uh, Oregon. This is an unbelievable honor to be included with the distinguished guests, and I was incredibly thrilled to be um, a part of today, and I want to pay tribute to Congressman Danny Davis, the Black Caucus, and for all the leaders in this field, and most particularly to Dr. Moore. You know, we sit on the bench every day, and you don't know me. I'm from Oregon. I'm out there doing the work um, in the courtrooms. But I was a district court judge uh, for the last 11 years, and I was a state court judge for 10 before that, so 21 years on the bench. And what I have to tell you is what I've learned, um, and it's an African proverb that we use in the context of how we put this together. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And what I will tell you we have done is we have seen the problem in the courtroom day in and day out. And we see the problems of individuals who come in before the court and who are facing sentence. And when you look at someone to do a sentencing and you look at this concept and these issues, you have to look at the fact that they will return to our communities. They will be part of our communities. And our job has to be about accountability and hope. Now, I think maybe we have the accountability down and need to tweak and address and uh, revamp what's an accountable offense and what we're to do with an offense. But we don't give anybody any hope. And when I came over from the state system, I found that I had any number of weapons to use in the arsenal of punishment, but I had no weapons, nothing, no incentives, no reminders to people that there is a life after sentence, there is an opportunity to reunite with your family, be constructive, and there is that accountability piece where you come back and you give back to society. And how you come back and how you become a person back in the community is all essential. So what I have to tell you is we just couldn't stand in the courts being failures. I didn't take this job to fail. I refused to be a failure on the bench. And as a judge on the bench, we're failing. We're failing the next generations because all we do is lock people up. And 650 to 700,000 people are coming out each and every year. They're coming back into our communities, and if we want to re-victimize our communities, if we want to damage people further, then we can stay the course. But it's time to change. And I have to tell you, in, in the um, early 2000s, when we came together and the silos of the system uh, met in Oregon, we met as a collaborative effort, state, federal partners, everyone came together. In Oregon, the issue that drove our debate was the unbelievable methamphetamine problem huge. It was destroying and ruining our state economically. And we came together and concluded that reentry, or in, that, in those days drug court, because we were marketing to the inmates to voluntarily come in and have intensive supervision by the court, and a team approach to help them reenter successfully was the approach. In 2007, that, um, that sort of little movement, I would say, that discussion between and among colleagues, there were seven sort of re-entry courts around different organizational strengths, seven in 2007. There are more than 40 because it's become this incredible movement between and among courts. And I have to say each court has organized differently depending on what has been their problem, how they judicially leveraged their communities, how they brought people together to address the issues. Oregon, it was methamphetamine. Eastern District of Missouri, you know, J Judge Carol Jackson, the chief judge, and Doug Burris, organized around unemployment. Pennsylvania, Philadelphia organized around violent crime. Western District of Michigan around employment. Every community has taken their problems on and looked at when people come out of prison, what's the issue and how do we address it? And we brought to the table everyone. It's a team approach, it's collaborative, it's multidisciplined, and it is designing individualized tailored services for individuals coming back into prison and to meet their needs and to help them walk out of the system. And the profound, the profound discussion we found is people don't expect us to be there to help them. They see this as the enemy. I am not their enemy. I am their person who's going to hold them accountable. But I'm also their lifeline to services. I'm their lifeline to opportunities, and I am their biggest champion. And what I tell you, we did, we set our model up. I'm an evidence-based practice person. We used evidence-based practices. I couldn't believe the federal government didn't really use them and fund them. We just funded whatever we could get, what was cheap. We didn't do our best practices. We didn't do the best work. We didn't data collect. We didn't fund the data. And we didn't set high expectations. Well, we're doing that in Oregon. And we went back and we studied it. So if you want to go online, you can get our study of how we set this up, what we did, how we did the work, and how it was um, evaluated. And I'm 
have take enormous credit for just being a, a sort of a catalyst, but Melissa Albin, who's noted on the report, who's a fellow with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, preeminent author, read four bodies of literature. So there's a literature search of all the, all the evidence you'd want to look at to settle a model program. It's all based on what's appropriate and what, what the model calls for. And those factors are, number one, the judge has to be involved. I couldn't believe when I read the literature how powerful the judge's role is in the life of reentry. We have given away all of our good power. We give it to probation without enough resource to do the job. And then the only time we see people is when they return to us so that we can resentence them. What we have found in our work and our study is people profoundly will change their life to receive the acknowledgement from an authority figure that they have a worthy endeavor to come back and be rehabilitated. We have tremendous good power. And we sit in our reentry court and there are weeks and months I go by where what I do is I compliment people. I help them get into school. I help find resources, reunite them with their families. I got into all of this because I'm a child abuse prevention person. I've worked on those programs for years and I was a juvenile judge. We reunite because people want something better for their children. So we need to use education, children, the future to make a difference for people. So we're collaborative, multidisciplined. It's about diagnosing and then when we find people having symptoms because they uh, make an offense or they use again or they, how, however they mistake their, their um, reentry, we up the support. It's not like a diabetic three times not managing your diabetes and, and having a difficulty. You go to the doctor and they say, too bad you die. We aren't, aren't going to serve you. Well, in the criminal justice setting, three times you go back to prison. Well, there's symptoms to this. And to the extent that they're not reoffending, we're working with those symptoms. So it's using a holistic approach and use the, using the research out of the National Institute of Health and Dr. Wilson Compton. So all those things are important and I would tell you, I, I happen to just be the person today, but there are judges across the country, collaborative efforts and we discuss this constantly and we are networked to have a conversation to see if we can do better work. So it helps rebuild, number one, your communities, number two, it helps by having a reentry court and bringing people back in with a judge involved, it helps with recovery capital to help people stay clean and sober, law-abiding, and employed. Those are critical factors. The, second, uh, the third thing I'd like to point out is resources. We need non-categorical dollars to address individualized tailored service delivery systems. It's not good to have a cookie-cutter approach and everybody gets slotted into certain kinds of treatment. We need to individualize that and address those problems. And sometimes they're, they're as simple as helping people get into school, getting job training, understanding their mental health or their medical needs, assisting them, guiding them, and giving them those resources. Sometimes we don't, just simply don't have those resources. Probation is limited. We can't even give them bus passes to get them around town. So we have to redesign and figure out how to get to probation the resources they need to help with those barriers to success. Finally, I would say Faye Taxman, if Dr. Taxman is still here in NIH, they are starting to look at incentives. What are the incentives that we need to help people change their lives and be successful? And those studies are ongoing because, very frankly, I rarely have to use sanctions. But what I do use are those incentives. And I probably put more people in school, GEDs, college, giving them an education and giving them a hand up than I, I would tell you in the reentry court we use our sanctions. And finally, it's really about the revictimization. This is a public safety issue. It's never more important than to be able to take somebody out of prison, bring them in thoughtfully, in a smart way, give them the tools, better work with the Bureau of Prisons. And I have to say we've been very lucky in Oregon because we have a wonderful relationship and we did our summit at the Bureau of Prisons and we have talked about getting further and further into the Bureau of Prisons so that we're training to the needs of the communities as, as people come back. And we look at strength-based service delivery systems that ensure that people will be successfully. Because in the final analysis, I'm a mother of five boys, in the final analysis, my job as a judge is to protect my community and to leave it in a better place for those who come, before, come after us. And if I don't even try to do that because I don't take the initiative and if I don't spend the time having the privilege of being in this room and hearing the incredible talent um, and, and trying from out in the, on the West Coast to connect up, you know, it's a big country. We all have different issues and different battles to fight. But if we don't fight this one successfully, we hand our children, along with any number of other problems, something we could have handled differently. So I applaud everyone's efforts today. It's, uh, again, I want to go together with you 
because going alone is really, it's going to take us an awfully long time. Thank you. Thank you very much.